been absolutely amazing to be a part of and to see all that God's been doing. Um, to go home, to close it out, we're going to go to um, a very familiar passage of Scripture. Uh, and it is my prayer that God would give us fresh eyes and fresh ears to see, hear, and experience these ancient words again for the very first time. Um, meet me in the book of Matthew 28, verse 19. Matthew 28, verse 19. It says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much. Father, these last few days, you've marked us. We've been marked by your presence and by your glory. So we pray that as we round third and head for home, that you would seal, seal us the words that you've given us. Holy Spirit, would you cover us in a very intimate and profound way? Father, we've all gathered here to listen, so would you speak, O oh Lord? Tune our ear to your voice so that we might hear you ever so clearly. Um, capture our hearts in a way that we won't miss not one thing that you have for us. God, it's to that end that I ask that you stand in my body, think through my mind, speak through my vocal cords, those things that you would have us say, know, and do. May the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart, be acceptable in thy sight. Oh, Lord, you are my strength. You are my redeemer. Get glory in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. He, um, he looks at the disciples, and he says, before I go, let me give you final instructions. And when he gives these instructions, it's interesting. He says, Go. Um, then he says, go and make disciples. He didn't say go and make money. He didn't say go and make new businesses. He didn't say go and make friends. He didn't say go and make love. I know it's awkward, but I just had to put that in there. Um, because... If we're not careful, those things will become the priority. He says, at the end of the day, all those other things will fade away, but go and do something that will have eternal impact. Go and make disciples. It's important that as you leave a missions conference, that you hear that the goal is not for you to go and make plans. Go and make a spreadsheet. Go and, and put it, put, put, go and make a donor list. Um, although some of you, you're really going to need a, a long one, a really good donor list. Um, but he says to the disciples, I need you to go and make disciples. And as we close our time together, it's possible that we've become so inundated with so many different messages and so many different things that have sparked inspiration and so many things that drive us that we will actually leave and almost kind of be overwhelmed and miss the very simple task that he's given us. At the end of the day, it ain't complicated. Make disciples. And you don't have to wait to your commissioning ceremony to Rwanda to go and do that. You don't have to wait to your commissioning ceremony when you go to Asia to do that. You don't have to wait till you start your career to go and do that. No, 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 no. When you walk out of that door, the assignment and the mission is clear. Go and make disciples. The work begins now. The ministry begins now. And it's the most important thing you can do because he sits down in his intimate settings and he makes this spiritual deposit. He says, what I've put in you, pass it on. 
I've, I've done something in you and through you. Don't let it stop with you. Go and make disciples. My fear is that this commission to go and make disciples has become so complicated, so inundated with just being overwhelmed with the burden that we've kind of lost the simplicity of it. It's like, go and make disciples. It's great to read books about it, but he didn't say, go and read books about discipleship. He didn't say, go and sing songs about discipleship. Go and write papers about discipleship. And you better get an A or else you're going to go to hell. Because what does it mean? <laughs> like, if you write a paper on discipleship and you get an F, what does that say about your soul? You know what I mean? Like, that's like, whoa, that's bad, right? Well, good thing that's not what God told you to do. He didn't say go and write papers. He didn't say go and sing songs. He didn't say go and preach sermons. Ooh, 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 go and, and, and just binge and go and listen to sermons about discipleship. Like, like, I mean, go deep. Do Francis Chan and all. You know what I mean? Because, like, you, if you opt in to listen to Francis, you're just asking for trouble. You know what I mean? Like, after you listen to Francis, you just want to give up. You know what I mean? Like, oh, my God, I just want to go be with Jesus now, you know? Especially Francis started doing that crying, talking thing he does. Oh, God, I just want you to do it. I want you to do it. Alive. You'd be like, oh, God, take me now, you know? And I love Francis. That's why I never listen to him. It's too convicting. <laughs> but, but, but that's not what God said do. He didn't say go listen to sermons. He actually said go and make disciples. So, friends, when you leave here, actually go and do it. Tell people the story of Jesus Christ and how his life transformed yours. See, I fear that we've made it too transactional. We, we've made it, we, we, and we can make disciples of this transactional thing and not this missional thing. Or we'll wait to this idea of once we go somewhere official or work at a church. No, 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 no. I Don't leave this conference thinking your only options are to work at a church or work on the mission field. He's not saying that. The, he's saying to them that, as, as a matter of fact, if you translate it appropriately, it's go and make disciples. It's not necessarily go and once I get there, I'm going to start making disciples because that's what making disciples looks like. Um, no, 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 no. It's not that. It's better the idea of as you are going, make disciples. Do, do you get the difference? It's not go to Africa. And when I get here, I'm going to learn the language. And seven years later, I'm going to make a disciple. Like, no. Like, no, and that's some of our, I mean, obviously, this is a missions conference. I, I get it. Somebody's going to Africa in here. Praise God. Uh, it's a beautiful thing. But don't feel like you got to go to Africa in order to be on mission for God. Do you see what I'm saying? Some of you, as you are going, you're not going to go to Africa. You're going to go be an engineer. And the idea is, as you are engineering, make disciples. As you are teaching third graders, Make disciples. As you are taking stats, pray and, <laughs> and, and then make disciples. You, you know what I'm saying? Like, like all roads don't lead to the same destination. And then what it does is the reason why I don't like that in the, in the, the international call and making that the main thing which, which I appreciate, like, I, I'm going to get fired at the missions conference because I'm not dogging that. I think that's beautiful, but what I'm saying is the rest of you say, well, I'm not called to do that, so I guess I'm off the hook. No! He's saying wherever you're going, wherever you're going, international, regional, local, or to the cafeteria, as you are going, make disciples. It's not some extracurricular job that if you get called, no, no, no. You've already answered the call. When you said yes to Jesus, you said yes to making disciples. When you said yes to Jesus, you said yes to the mission field. When you said yes to Jesus, you said take my life and use it for your glory. And I'm saying as you go into business administration, as you go on the mission field in Mexico, as you go to mission field to Hawaii, which is I'm praying for that call daily. Um, as, as you are going, make disciples. So as you leave this missions conference, wherever the Lord's pushing you, wherever the Lord is nudging you, don't wait till you get there. 
as you're going, make disciples. It's not some transactional thing either. It requires a lifelong commitment of walking with people. It's kind of like this. It's like going to the grocery store. When um, the worst thing my wife can say to me is, honey, I need you to go to the grocery store. I, I immediately get discouraged. Because <laughs> I know there's no way I'm going to win. Because inevitably, I'm going to go to the grocery store, and I'm going to come back with the wrong thing. And then I'm going to be scorned and shunned and shamed. It's a setup (laughs) from the pits of hell to discourage me and shrink my male ego, which is really big. Like, I just, like, I think they move stuff around in the grocery store just to mess with my emotions. You know what I mean? Like, I know I came here last week and the bread was right here. And then I'm in the grocery store. I'm the guy in the grocery store that just be standing there like this. And, I don't, and I'll come back home and I know I'll come back home with sugar and she'll be like, this isn't the sugar we use. I was like, babe, you said on the list sugar. I said, no, I want organic sugar. I always use, it's like, babe, well, I just, you didn't say organic sugar. You just said sugar. She says, all these bags, have you ever seen a bag this color in, the, in our kitchen? I'd be thinking, babe, I've, I've never noticed the colors of this sugar bag in my life. I didn't know that was a part of my responsibility. That wasn't in our vows. You know what I mean? It's like, like sugar is sugar, lady. You know what I mean? Of course, I didn't say that out loud. I said that in my head. Because <laughs> the therapist has said over the years, Albert, you shouldn't say those things out loud. Out loud, you should work on your inner voice. And I was like, okay, doctor, I'm working on it. So, so I'm in the grocery store, y'all, and I'm telling you, I'm just looking out aisles. And then she has me go to buy, like, womanly things. <laughs> and I don't know how, why I whispered it, but it just seemed appropriate not to whisper it. You know what I mean? So. I'm on like the womanly aisle, and I don't know, I'm, I'm afraid. <laughs> I'm very afraid, and other women, they pass by me, and they, they, I know they're talking about me in their head. I know they are, because they, they just look at me, and, they, and I just know, because I'm sitting there on the aisle, and I'm just looking. <laughs> There's so many options. I don't, I don't. I don't know if she needs wings or not. I've never seen her fry. She doesn't fly around our house. I don't know. I don't, I don't know what to do. And, and women, they just look at They're looking and making fun of me behind my back. And I'm just so confused. So finally then I ask for help, right? I ask for help. And then they, the little worker act like they don't want to help a brother. You know what I mean? They just run and doing their own thing. I was like, sir, excuse me, I, uh, where's the Velveeta cheese? And he was like, um, I'm just down on a, just go, go down three, three aisles and then turn to the left and it'll be right there. And then thank you. And then he goes off and vanishes. So I'm looking down three aisles and I don't see nothing. And, and then another lady come and, you know, people from my church be seeing me like, oh, that looks, looks like Pastor Albert Tate. He's, he looks so confused. So they, I know they're talking about me. So I, I, I said, excuse me, ma'am, I'm trying to find a Velveeta cheese. I, which which aisle? She's like, it's on aisle six. And I was like, okay, great. Well, where is aisle six? She says, uh, the numbers are right above you. I said, well, lady, if I would have known that, I wouldn't have asked you where aisle six was. Then I, so then I'm about to go off on this lady. Then some more church members walk by. I said, oh, is that Pastor Tate? He seems so angry. And I so... So now I can't lose. So I go, and guess what? Because I'm looking down the cheese aisle. Guess what? Velveeta cheese ain't even on the cheese aisle. It don't even go with the cheese, which says a lot about Velveeta. What kind of cheese is it if it ain't even on the cheese aisle? Like, it's in a box over here. It ain't even refrigerated. Is this really even cheese? Honey, what do you have me buying here? Is this good for us? So I leave, and I'm just confused. And I just don't know where I'm going. I come home, and then I'm scorned and shamed. And then she calls and orders it all online and has it delivered. Which I say, why didn't you do that in the first place? <laughs> it's, it's unlike going to Home Depot. Anybody ever go to Home Depot? Yo, 
if you ever go to Home Depot, and what they what they do is because they got big aisles. I mean, Home Depot is the most confusing place in the world. I mean, in one store, you can either build a house or buy a Kit Kat. Like you can do all of that. You can do all of that at the same store. Like it's ridiculous. You know what I mean? But they have a principle and a and a, a philosophy at Home Depot. If you ask for directions, watch this. They don't just point you and direct you. They'll actually walk with you. They'll say, oh, you, you're looking for nails? I said, yes, ma'am, please. She says, oh, well, just follow me. And she walks me to the place where we can get nails. And I get nails. Then she says, uh, sir, is there anything else we can help you? I thought, as a matter of fact, there is. I need light bulbs. She's like, oh, well, great. Thank, thank you, Mr. Tate. Yeah, your wife called ahead before you got here. Uh, we, I'll take you right over here. But, but they don't point you to it, they walk you to it. I fear that we've got a concept of discipleship where we point people and we don't walk with people. We point people to it and we don't walk people through it. Oh, yeah, that was good. You ought to shout right there. That was good. Say amen. Yeah. So when he says, go make disciples, he's not saying, say a prayer in the cafeteria and then point them to where they need to go next. No, he's saying, walk with them. Go and make disciples. As you're going, walk with people and teach and evangelize as you're going. Baptism is the idea of evangelism, bringing them to a place, to public, to, to conversion, and then teaching them along the way. You do this as you are going. So as you're going to class this semester, make disciples. Walk with them. Don't just have a moment in the, after a chapel and pray and then say, well, good luck. I hope you find Velveeta Jesus next. You know what I mean? Like, what? No, you don't point them to it. You walk them through it. You use your life to walk with people. Discipleship and sharing the good news about Jesus Christ is not transactional. It's relational. So it requires your life making a personal investment in this person, in this brother or sister in Christ. So that means you got to open up your life. And what God has done for you, who God has been to you, you share that and you open up the scriptures and you allow the scriptures to illuminate your life. And as the light shines through you, it begins to be on display and inspire and bring about hope and transformation to the people that you've been called to pour into. Does that make sense? So discipleship in the prayer, sharing the gospel in just some transactional action, is not just you pointing people to the next aisle, but it's you walking with them. It's relational, taking your life and opening it. And some of us, we get intimidated by that because the idea of it being relational means that they're going to see my life. And that's true, they are. You've got to invite people into your life. Resist the temptation to become hypocritical. Don't have your discipleship ambassador self and then your real self. Like, no, you're the same self. You see what I'm saying? It's like inviting somebody over to the crib. I'm, I'm sorry, your home or place of residence or the place where you <laughs> daily reside. Like, like, I'm the type of person, like, you just can't pop over at my house. You know what I mean? We need time to prepare because I got kids and my kids are messy. And my kids irritate me because every time I tell them to clean up, they be saying, why we got to clean up? Is somebody coming over? <laughs> somebody does not have to be coming over to the house to clean up. You should clean up because your room is nasty. It smells bad in there and something can grow and kill you. That's why you should clean up. It should not be a special occasion of somebody coming to the house to clean up. You should clean up just because you should clean up. Now get in your room and clean up because somebody's coming over in 15 minutes. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like you got to get it right. But then there's some friends that, that, you know, I don't care. You just come in. You know how your dorm room be messed up? And you be like, girl, just come on in. Just <laughs> step over the dead body. That's Uncle Henry. They're going to come pick him up next week. Don't even worry about it. Just come on in with what is. You know what I mean? But what I notice is that when I invite people in and the room is a mess, even though I'm comfortable with them coming in and just like, I don't even care. I just see mess that I didn't see before in the room. 
It's like your eye just like, is that, is that a banana peel? I mean, I'm cool with Sarah, but girl, yeah, you're doing good. Yeah, let me just, let me just get this. girl, my roommate is a mess, girl. I just, you, you know what I'm saying? You just, you kind of notice stuff that did, before you didn't even notice the apple core. You know what I mean? It's like, but there it is. This, that a, it's, yeah, Sarah, yeah. It's a, it's a decaying apple <laughs> on the TV stand. Um, yeah, and she said, what? Girl, that's crazy. Let me, let me just throw this away. It's, it's a kiss. My roommate child, you know, and she allergic to apples. That's you. That ain't your roommate. But that's okay. Just, because what happens is we, even when somebody else is in the room, even though you're comfortable with them being in the mess, you're more aware of your mess. And you're less likely to sit in your mess because someone else is in that space with you. If you get it early, I won't have to preach as long. Do you see where I'm going with this? I, I guess what I'm saying is when you're walking with people, you invite them into the messiness of your life. And when they're in the messiness of your life, you're probably more inclined to clean up some areas that you otherwise would have been comfortable with if someone else wasn't sitting in that relationship with you being discipled. Do, do you understand what I'm saying? Like, like if, I'm, if I'm discipling Tim and I know I got to meet with Tim and I know that on Tuesday we're going to talk about uh, Tim's uh, struggle with lust. Guess what? While I'm preparing and praying about meeting with Tim about his lust, guess what I'm going to be talking about too with the Lord? My own lust. Because like, Lord, I can't be talking with Tim about lust, and I got lust myself. You got lust, I got lust, all God's children got lust. How do I begin to put that before the Lord? I'm telling you, as you walk with other people, God walks with you, and your investment in them will become an investment in you. Do, do you understand what I'm saying? And you will find yourself walking holier and more honestly and more tr authentically and more transparently before God than you did, did if you were walking alone. Why? Because of when you invest in someone else the gospel, it returns and reinvests in you because that's what you were made to do and it keeps you. D does that make sense? So he says, as you are going... Don't go alone. As you are engineering, as you are applying to go to the mission field, as you're going back to class, as you're going out this weekend, make disciples. Have relationships around you that you're intentionally investing in, and that requires a life investment. And here's the thing. You ain't got to be perfect. You, your life is messy. Just turn around and tell your neighbor, just say, child, my life is a mess. Tell, tell your neighbor, say that like that. Okay, no, y'all got that all wrong. I did not, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I did not say, child, your life is a mess. No, I said, child, your life is a mess. All right, now turn around and tell your neighbor that, child, my life is a mess. Some of y'all sitting next to somebody, you said, I've been waiting on you to acknowledge that for three semesters now. I tell you, I've been waiting, girl, it's about time you confessed it because I didn't talk about you in my life group several times. Your life is a mess. So it's not about being perfect. Some of you take that and you feel like you got to be perfect on campus. You got to show, no, 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 no. It's the idea that God is making you better. God is working on you. Not you ambassador and you called and you got life with missions and all that, but that don't mean your life ain't a mess. That don't mean, it's, you're not perfect, but you're getting better. Bishop Kenneth Ulmer, my mentor, he says it this way. He says, um, boy, when I was in the world, I used to cuss at the drop of a hat. Now that I've been walking with Jesus, I don't cuss that fast anymore. It, it <laughs> take a little longer to get cussed out by me. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> God is working on me. I, it take you a long time to get cussed out for me. Hallelujah. Oh, am I the only one? Don't act like I'm the only Am I the only one up in here? Is God... It's the idea of God working on me. So as I'm going, I'm making disciples. And as, I, as he's moving in you, he's moving in me, and therefore he's moving in us. He's making us better. As you leave this conference, go. And as you are going, make disciples. The next thing I want you to think about is, he says, of all nations. It, it's, it's the idea that this would be passed on. God is saying, of what, what I put in Jesus and what Jesus and I had in this Trinitarian paracoretic dance, 
Jesus has now made this deposit through the Godhead, through this Trinitarian dance. He's now invited these disciples to come and be a part of this new fellowship, this new community that they can only have full access to the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. And he says, I've, I've now put something in you. Peter, I've put something in you. Matthew, i put something in you. John, i put something in you. And now you go. And the spiritual legacy, the spiritual deposit that you receive, you now go put it in someone else. You go pass it on. As much as God has done for you, the freedom that he's given you, the liberation, the chains that have fallen off, the burden he's giving you, he didn't give that to you for you just to hold on to yourself. He says, I've given it to you so you can put it in somebody else. The idea is that you pass it on. What a shame. If 40 years from now at the missions conference, the room is empty, because when you left, you got the deposit, but you didn't pass it on. What a shame if you allow God to show you so much about his glory and so much about his love and so much about his freedom, and you just go to class as usual. You just graduate and live as usual. You go and you fulfill your dreams, but you don't fulfill his calling that's on your life. He didn't give it to you for you to create a spiritual cul-de-sac in your life and you just receive it. No, he put it in you so you can now go put it in someone else. He gave you a spiritual legacy. Shame on you if you don't pass it on. He says, go and make disciples and take it to the nations. Pass it on. God has been so good to you. You've seen his glory. Don't you dare keep it to yourself. Pass it on. Is it not worthy to be passed on? Is it not worthy of telling? Some of you, when you go home this summer, you got friends from school that you grew up with. They don't know, they don't, they haven't seen, they haven't heard. And you need to pass it on. Some of you got family members. You need to pass it on. Some of you got roommate. I don't know how they got in Biola, but they got in here. <laughs> they lied somewhere on that application. They, they did something. They didn't tell the truth. Because you see, they're, they desperately need a savior. You see that they're broken. You see that they're living outside of God's will. And here you are, just kicking it with them. But have you passed it on to them? Have you told them of the glory that's transformed your life? Pass it on. As a little kid, I'll never forget watching back in the early 90s this special honoring of Sammy Davis Jr. Now, if you don't know who Sammy Davis Jr. is, he was a phenomenal dancer, singer, performer, entertainer, one of the greatest of his time. In this special on TV, I remember being a little kid and watching the special on TV, and this special was unique because it was going to be his last one. It was where they would honor him, but before the, it aired, it was publicly announced that he had terminal cancer. So everyone's in this room honoring a man who they know was about to die. That added an emotional weight to the program, and you just felt it, after, felt it after one celebrity after another came on to pay tribute to Sammy Davis Jr. sitting there in his black tuxedo, open white collar shirt with his dangling bow tie, classic Sammy Davis Jr. One artist after another would come on the stage but the room came to its feet when Gregory Hines, one of his premier mentees, came on the stage. Gregory Hines was his favorite. He was his number one disciple, if you will. And Gregory Hines came out, and Sammy was sitting right there, and Gregory Hines began to dance. He began to tap dance, and as he tap danced, knowing that he's tap dancing and dancing for his mentor who was dying, the tears were streaming down his face. The room 
came to their feet as he culminated his dance and he tapped like only he could. Just some of the most amazing movements you've ever seen. And he ends his tap dance by moving towards Sammy and then collapsing in his arms as they fell in an embrace as the room stood, applauded, and cried. Then something happens. Sammy Davis Jr. signals for his shoes. The room goes crazy. And Sammy takes off his shoes, puts on his tap shoes, and he moves to the center of the stage. And Sammy and Gregory Hines tap dance together. This would be the last time that the world will see old Bojangles, Sammy Davis Jr. dancing on a stage. But we'll soon discover that it wouldn't be the last time that he danced. Gregory Hines, at his funeral, stood at the podium. And as he was giving the eulogy, he tells to the audience for the very first time that Sammy Davis did dance again. Gregory Hines tells the story of him going to see Sammy Davis Jr. in hospice. It's the place where they go, where you go when there's nothing else they can do for you. And the goal at hospice is just to make you as comfortable as possible before you pass away. Gregory Hines went to go see his mentor. And there in the hospital room, in the hospice, Gregory says, I dance for my mentor one more time. So imagine the scene, Gregory Hines in the hospice room dancing for Sammy. This was more emotional than ever before because Sammy is days away from his death and Gregory is dancing for him. And then he culminates, leans on the bed, hugs and holds Sammy, whispers how much he means to him, and then kisses him on his forehead and tells him goodbye. As Gregory prepares to leave, something happens. Sammy Davis Jr., sick, feeble body, shrunken with the effects of the cancer. His face is sunken in. All you see are the bones. But this feeble Sammy Davis Jr. starts scooting off of the bed. And he starts pushing himself up. And the nurses come in and, they, and he shoes them away. He's pulling pulling the stuff off of his face, pulling off the cords. And Sammy Davis, feeble in his body, stands up in front of Gregory Hines. And he starts to dance. And as he slowly moves with his feeble body, he dances. And then he does something. Gregory Hines tells the audience at the funeral. He motions in a way that he has never forgotten. He motions in a way that literally transformed Gregory Hines' life. Sammy, with his feeble, cancer-ridden body, he dances. Then he looks at Gregory Hines, and he does this. He motions him as if to say, I'm passing it on. My legacy, I pass it on to you. My dance, I pass it on to you. As Gregory Hines received it with tears in his eyes, I'm telling you 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ stood on that hill and he looks at his disciples and he says, I'm passing it on to you, and I've come here by all of this missions conference to tell you as you leave this place, pass it on. Pass it on. Pass it on. God has given you something. He's put a deposit in your life. He's giving you a purpose. He's giving you a promise. He's giving you a plan. Don't you sit on it. God has given it to you so you can pass it on. Pass on this legacy. Pass on this glory. Pass on this truth. Pass on this salvation. Pass it on. Pass it on. Pass it on. Don't you dare allow all that God has done in you 
not be done through you. Ooh, that was good. Somebody ought to tweet that. Did somebody get that? Don't you dare. I'll say it again. Don't you dare let all that God has done in you not be done through you. Pass it on. Finally, he says, when I think about the Great Commission, this is my favorite part. The King James Version says, and lo, I'll be with you always, even until the end. Do you know what he's saying there? He's saying, I'm calling you to do something big. It's going to mark your relationship. It's going to require you living in integrity outside. It's going to require you inviting people into the messy places of your life. It's going to require you not just to send people, but to actually walk with people. It's going to be hard. It's going to be challenging because there are going to be times on this journey when you're going to feel very unqualified to be leading anybody anywhere. There are going to be times on this journey where the enemy is going to try to come after your identity and you're going to think you ain't qualified to do it. There are going to be times on this journey where you feel like you're by yourself. There are going to be times on this journey when you're going to want to throw in the towel. I'm calling you to do something hard. So if you think you're going to leave this conference and everything is just going to come easy, you think the serpent's just going to get out of your way and say, oh, yes, come into this region and I'll remove all the demonic structures so that you can have a prosperous calling in ministry. You have lost your mind. It will be hard. Don't you let people stand on this stage and make you think it's going to be easy. Don't you allow our eloquence of speech and our beautiful little stories to make you think you can just go out and do it. No, it will be the hardest thing that you have ever done in your life. It will be challenging. But he says, don't worry. You ain't going by yourself. I'm going with you. I will be with you. I didn't call you to this hard thing and say, yeah, just send me prayer letters and cards and update me every now and then and let me know how it was going. No, I'm going with you. And if he goes with you, that means he's going to do it. He's going to do the heavy lifting. You need to expect. That. Here's the last thing. Then I'm going to sit down. Here's the, here's the thing you need to go. As you go, expect God to move. Expect God to do great things. Don't be timid and scared and fearful. I wonder if they're going to say yes. If Jesus is with you, of course they're going to say yes. Like his word will not return void. They may not say yes when you want them to say yes. It may not move when you think it ought to move. But don't you go on the mission field and don't you go in his name and not take expectation for him to move. It amazes me of how little we expect God to do amazing things. We set our beliefs so low. Well, I'm hoping that something will happen. Of, it. of course it's going to happen. Do you know who you rolling with? I'm sorry, rolling with. Uh, walking alongside on a continual basis. Do you know who you are with? You are with the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Alpha and the Omega, the Great I Am, the First and the Last. He is the Great I Am, El Shaddai, Jehovah Jireh, Jesus Christ. That's who you're with. And if you're going with him, you can believe he's going to do what he said. He's going to move on your behalf. Don't walk with him and not believe in his power. Don't walk with him and not take your faith. If God's called you to change the world, believe that with his power and in his glory and by his grace, you're going to change the world. God has whispered some things to some of you. You saw it. Let me tell you how you know it's God. Because if you saw it and it scared you, then you know it's God. <laughs> if you saw it and you figured out in five minutes how you could pull it off, that ain't God. That's just a good idea. No, seriously, because God ain't giving you that. Because if you can pull it off, you wouldn't need God. But if you saw it and you almost cussed, you're probably in the right spirit. I mean, not admonishing, cussing or anything. You know, I don't I want Dr. Corey calling me. Uh, but, uh, 
but it ought to intimidate you. It ought to be a big task. If he gave you a burden and it ain't heavy, it probably ain't from the Lord. That's probably gas. That's probably a burrito. <laughs> do, do you know what I'm saying? Like, you don't need to pray. You just need to go to the bathroom. Like, that is not, that is not, but, but if you got something and you feel it in the pit of your stomach, and you woke up last night at 3, 4 o'clock in the morning saying, God, what are you doing with me? If your friends are starting to think you're weird, because you walk around in the days because you're mesmerized at the weightiness of what God's trying to do in you, then you're probably on the right path. I'm telling you, God, if he didn't do it this weekend, he's going to begin to show you purpose. He's going to give you glimpses, upcoming attractions of who he's called you to be. Not just what he's called you to do, but who he's called you to be. And when you see it, it ought to freak you out just a little bit. Like if you see what God's going to do and you're like, praise Jesus, hallelujah, I get to do this. Not only are you weird, but that's probably not it. It's going to be big, y'all. It's going to shape you at your very core. And you're going to have to have faith. I want you to leave out of this room with a belief in God, knowing that he can do exceedingly and abundantly above all that you could ask or think. And that he's not sending you. He's not pointing you. He's walking with you. And if he's walking with you, you ought to believe that he's going to do what he said he's going to do. Leave out of here with an expectation so big that only God can fulfill it. I'll close with this. There's a story of a sister named Mother Mary. Uh, Mother Mary was an old lady, she lived down in the Mississippi Delta. And out in that area, agriculture was a big deal. They made their money off of uh, farming. And they were experiencing a drought. The drought had been going so long that if they were to go another season without rain, y'all, some would lose their crops. Some would lose their businesses. So the pastor of the little local church there in the Delta, he said, we're going to have a special prayer meeting. And we're going to call the church together, and we are going to pray for rain. So y'all, listen, the heat of the summer in Mississippi, humidity is 155 million degrees. And they're sitting on the porch, and they're getting ready for this Sunday night prayer. Well, they're going to pray and believe God for rain. The deacons are sitting out on the porch, and they're just waiting to get started, trying to get some air. And they see walking up the street, see, who is that? That's Mother Mary. Well, Mother Mary looked weird because Mother Mary is about 80 years old. And they see Mother Mary, and Mother Mary's got on a raincoat. She got on a rain hat. She wearing goulashes. She got an umbrella in one hand and the cane in the other. And she walking up to the church, sweating. The deacon see Mother Mary and said, Mother Mary, why? Why has you got all these clothes on? Like, uh, ain't you hot, Mother Mary? What is you doing? Mother Mary looked at him and she said, well, I figured if we's going to be praying for rain, I might as well come prepared. So Mother Mary, they get in the sanctuary, and y'all, they start calling on Jesus. They start praying. They start calling on the God of Isaac, Jacob, Abraham, uh, everybody. Uh, they call, you know. They call on Jesus, and all of a sudden, as they're calling on heaven and praying on God to, pre pre to bring the rain, all of a sudden, they heard a drip, then a drop, then a drip, then a drop. And all of a sudden, they hear the pitter-patter of rain coming down. As you can imagine, y'all, they got so excited, they ran outside. Y'all, Mother Mary had her cane in her hand, umbrella, and she just dancing around in the rain. They just celebrating. But then all of a sudden, panic broke in because they remembered at home, we left our windows open. We left our, we left our car windows down. And they all begin to scramble because what they were praying for, they weren't prepared for. 
I'm telling you, Biola, when you leave this place, you need to believe God for rain. Believe that his glory is going to rain down transformation, rain down salvation, rain down his glory, and you need to leave here ready for the rain. Anybody ready for the rain in your life? Anybody ready for the rain for your calling? Anybody ready for the rain? You need to get ready for the rain because the rain of God is about to rain down in your life. Oh, you ain't acting like you're ready for the rain. If you're ready for the rain, give God some glory in this place and say, I'm ready for the rain. Lord, send the rain in my life. Send the rain in my life. Send the rain in my life for his glory. Amen. Discover who you're called to be at Biola University, a leading Christ-centered university in Los Angeles, with programs on campus and online. Subscribe for more of our videos and learn more at biola.edu.